We are in the executive mansion in Raleigh for a half hour discussion with Governor Pat McCrory next on North Carolina Now. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you who invite you to join them in supporting UNC TV. here in the executive mansion with North Carolina's Governor Pat McCrory. Thank you, sir, for having us in your home. Welcome to the people's home. Average families don't follow state politics too closely, but they might know there's a 400 plus million dollar surplus. Mm. There's three different leaders in this state within a block of each other with three different ideas. What's the best way to utilize that 400 million? Well, first of all, the first thing we ought to do, it's good news that we have a four and maybe even more million dollar, $400 million surplus, because when I did the budget just uh, four months ago, the governor has to do the budget first. We had a, about a $300 million deficit, so I had to make all the tough decisions regarding cuts, but to have uh, more revenue in our coffers is gonna be very good, but we've gotta first make sure we have our rainy day fund build up. Right now, only 3% of our budget is in the rainy day fund, which is not sufficient for a $21 billion budget. So the first thing I'd agree to is let's put at least 6% into a rainy day fund because it's not if, but when a downturn will occur or a, a natural disaster or a man-made disaster could occur, which could impact the reserves of uh, state government. So I'm a conservative in a sense in both my personal life and in government that you ought to have money in the savings account in case of a crisis. This rainy day fund you hear about all the time, how should it be used? Because I've been here years when they needed a rainy day because it was a recession, and I've also seen it tap for projects and things that were just financially inconvenient. How would you it handle it? It should be used for emergencies. It should be used for natural disasters. It should be used for, you know, if you have a sudden uh, misforecast. For example, when I came into office, we had a $520 million misforecast of uh, for Medicaid expenses, which, main, which basically meant we did not have a balanced budget as predicted, that's when you have to prepare for such a thing. And if there's a sudden downturn in the economy, which the downturn means your projections are way off, you've got a deal. That's why you have a rainy day fund, just like we have in our personal life. State House and Senate leaders are um, expecting a rather long, hot, arduous summer to hammer out a budget, including some discussion about that rainy day fund. House wants a 6% increase in state spending. The Senate's dialing in at 2% with some tax cuts. You can weigh in the middle of this all you want down there behind closed doors, but where do you see your role fitting in as they negotiate? Well, the same role I played during the last two budgets, and I had a very, very central and strong role with the last two budgets, and we came together. We had some compromises such as, uh, on such things as tax reform, which I'm glad we did because had we not done those compromises, we probably wouldn't have a uh, surplus like we have today. So I'm very, very active myself and my cabinet in discussions with both the House and Senate. But what's unique about this year is that the House and Senate are so far apart in their two budgets. They're not even in the same room, much less the same House. And I guess this is why the founders have two different chambers. And we have two different chambers within the same branch of government, all within the same party that strongly disagree on how money should be spent and how money should be saved. And as a member of the executive branch, I also have some strong agreements with both branches and also some strong disagreements. And I will not be hesitant to state where I stand on the agreements and where I stand on the disagreements on the uh, two budgets that have been presented. Which budget more reflects your value, Senate or the House? I, I don't know if you really could split it that way. I think you've got to take, uh, there are certain things in the, in the House budget that we like. For example, the economic development bill is basically what we've asked for. It does not have a sunset. It, re, it, it brings about some predict, predictability, which our Commerce Secretary needs very much. Very, very pleased with that where the Senate budget on the economic development has a two-year sunset and also has some things with, which are very discouraging to recruit um, a headquarter locations. So regarding economic development things, I like the House budget. Regarding reserves, we like the Senate budget. And there are many other agreements and disagreements within the $21 billion budgets that we have. I think you're seeing a lot of, uh, a little bit of uh, neg public negotiating between the House and Senate right now where they're inflating certain numbers 
for a reason to negotiate, and I don't think that's the way we should be uh, doing things in Raleigh. That's the way the old regime used to do things. Let's just be honest with the public and honest with each other and uh, be true to our numbers of what we need. Um, but there are some strong policies that I, I disagree with. In fact, the Senate budget, I disagree with so many policy initiatives in the Senate budget. Uh, that's what we used to criticize the Democrats for doing under Easley and Purdue and Bass Knight and Rand and, and that group. Uh, they used to stick policy into their budget, which I don't think is the right way to uh, um, proceed with uh, legislative government. You will get to that in just a few moments. But talking about money, the Senate says if we lower corporate rates, income tax rates in the state, that's the best stimulus we could have, not incentives that you in the House seem to prefer. What's the, you, what's the balance on that? I think you need both. Uh, and we agreed to a tax reform uh, to, uh, 14, 15 months ago in which the ink is barely dry. And I'm very, very proud of that. And it seems to be working. I don't think we need major tax reform within a year and a half of the agreement that we had. I think we ought to be strategic. I think we ought to be systematic and more predictable. But if we have major tax reform every year and a half, we're not going to send a strong message of continuity and predictability in our business community and to the taxpayers of North Carolina. I agree with some minor changes, including historical tax credits, including a medical deduction, which the House put in, for, especially for senior citizens. Uh, those are minor revisions. I, I would also agree with, uh, we're looking at some tax revisions to help more manufacturing in North Carolina. Those are minor tax revisions with the tax plan that we approved, but some of the major stuff, uh, for example, uh, transferring uh, local sales tax from one county to another is something I strongly object to, and I think it uh, goes counter to what our responsibility is in state government. You travel this state talking to Republicans. I mean, they helped elect you by and large. When it comes to tax cuts and, and tax policy, what is it they really want? Because some legislators believe you cut taxes every opportunity you get if you can support it and still keep your b budget balanced. Well, that's the goal is keeping the budget balanced. And I've got, a, I've got as governor, I'm responsible for the operations of government. I'm responsible for both, both sides of the ledger sheet, the money coming in and the money going out. And if we have an impact on just one and not the other, that means we don't have a balanced budget. And as governor, I'm going to make sure as a conservative I want to make sure we have fiscal responsibility where uh, I have the more liberal elements who, of the legislature will go, let's spend everything we have. And I have the conservative elements who go, well, let's cut taxes and everything we have. But those two don't match up. And spending and cuts don't match up. And I think there is a middle ground that I'll be striving for, as I did in the last two years. And uh, I think that worked out pretty good with the math that the executive branch used. How does the act of governance change in North Carolina when you have leaders of chambers who are in districts that are pretty safe for them? They run good, strong campaigns to do what their people want. And a, and a gentleman like yourself in the executive branch who runs at large, who feels that purple paintbrush paint this state, how does that change the calculus? Oh, Budget, definitely. social issues, the, the whole run of it. It definitely changes the dynamics. For anyone running a statewide office, you tend to have to you can't look at a narrow silo, whether it be in a Republican or Democratic silo, as uh, we have in our gerrymandered districts, both at the state and federal level. So I have to look at the whole state, uh, not just from a conservative or liberal standpoint, but also from a east-west Piedmont. I do not look at the state in a silo. I look at more of a state as integrating strategy together, transportation strategy, economic development strategy, education strategy, environmental strategy, all integrated together, not in silos, one into the same. And I did that as a mayor, and I'm doing that as a governor. And sometimes that's really where I have my disagreements with our legislature, whether it be Republican or Democrat. They tend to be mo more siloed because they're represented more by a, a monolithic um, uh, uh, citizen group by whom elect them. And I understand it completely, but uh, my customer base, my, my uh, my constituency is much more broad. You're asking for $2.85 billion. 
the state would borrow it and it would invest immediately in infrastructure, community colleges. I thought I saw a bombing range in there or something. <laughs> uh, what is the a uh, bombing range? Uh, was some, there's some kind of land for the militaries. Milita yeah, military you, you, fencing you, for some of the military and also for the National Guard. We've got some facilities for our National Guard that are just in horrible shape. It's not if we need to fix them, we have to fix them. And the earlier the better, and, and, and for the sake of our guard. You've laid out everything on that website. If you Google it, you can find it, Connect NC. Connect NC, right. Speaking of a disagreement, you're, I've heard you've been down to the legislature and had meetings with the caucuses to say, support my plan. What's the problem with conservatives in issuing a bond? Um, I have some people uh, who call themselves conservatives who disagree with borrowing money. But if that's the case, we shouldn't borrow money to do or build our, uh, to buy a home or to buy a car. And I disagree with that. I think a lot of small businessmen have to borrow money. Now, I don't believe in borrowing money for unemployment insurance. I call that credit card borrowing. And I'm so proud of our agreement between us and the legislature in the last two years to pay off $2.6, $2.7 billion of debt in which my predecessor and previous legislatures had no idea how they were going to pay it back, and they had nef nothing left after they borrowed that money. Uh, we paid off that debt as of two months mm -hmm. ago, and we ought to be proud of that. But debt to build things is the way small business and, and homeowners work every day. Our economy is built upon that. And why not do it at a point in time when our interest rates are at the lowest we'll ever see in our lifetime? And um, I did that as a mayor, and I, I hope to do that as a governor. Because we've got to build new lane capacity in our roads. We've got to help with our ports in Moorhead City and, uh, and Wilmington. We've got to help with our National Guard. Our state parks have been really not fixed up now for 15 to 20 years. We have not had a bond referendum in North Carolina for over 15 years. And the debt from this new bond referendum after four or five years will be less than, than the debt we currently have on our books. How do you balance when you go around the state? Because uh, your press release has hit my mailbox. So and so, this group supports me. That group supports me. This school supports me. How getting, do you keep your promises level uh, against uh, three big ones a lot, but it's not at all? Well, after I announced this, a survey was done which shows 65 to 70 percent support for all the bonds. Um, outside, we're getting support from the Chamber of Commerce, is local Chamber of Commerce, not necessarily from the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce, which is another issue. Uh, from um, groups, from city councils, from county commissions, bipartisan. It's inside the Beltline, which is my greatest challenge. And to their defense, they're trying to put a lot of fires out right now. But our job is not just put out fires. Our job is to prepare the state for the next generation. Not for the next election, but for the next generation. And that's my responsibility as governor. Is your opinion the state's falling apart with infrastructure, or are you wanting to just catch up on the maintenance of what we have, build a few new, address lanes and big cities, those sorts of projects. It's a combination of both. We have some major maintenance facilities where buildings are falling down, uh, bridges are in terrible shape. You've got to, you've got to fix these things. And like in your own home, the more you let your, your roof uh, be in disrepair, the more expensive it's going to get in the future. But we also have to do things like add lane capacity in areas where we know we're, that are growing. And I firmly believe that you anticipate the pain as opposed to reacting to the pain, you'll have more success. And it'll be cheaper for the taxpayer of North Carolina. And that, that's a conservative thing to do. And I think um, some of my conservatives and some of my liberal friends uh, tend to think more short, short term when it's our job to think long term. Uh, I've often said to you and others that I'm a fan of Dwight David Eisenhower uh, as president. He, he built the interstate system. And had he not done that, think of how our country would be different today. And we better start preparing for the next 50 years so the next generation can have the same quality of life and economic opportunities that we're getting in, in North Carolina right now. The assumption is the state of North Carolina's voters would vote on a bond referendum. Yeah, I, I can remember ought, years past. Why, you not let the, why not let the voters decide this? And I think there's a little bit of hesitation, too, inside the Beltline here to let that happen. They like to control things. I like to decentralize things and have more local control and let the people decide. But present them the vision, present them the detailed plan, and I think that's what leadership is all about. But, you know, I'm sure we're going to have some compromises, but it's my job as governor to lead and to lay out the vision for the future of North Carolina. And thank God we had visionary leaders from 20, 30 years ago that did the same thing. 
that we're benefiting from today, and it's my responsibility to do the same thing. We haven't done it for 15 to 20 years in North Carolina. We have not invested in infrastructure, in our roads, in our rail, in our universities, in our community colleges, in our parks. Now, this is our quality of life. This is our economic vitality, and I'm, we're competing against South Carolina and Georgia and Tennessee and Virginia and the rest of the world, and as new businesses come here, I want to show them that while they're investing, we're investing also in the infrastructure to support them. What about the Senate position that they're going to stop, they would stop the outflow of cash from the Highway Trust Fund, free up about a quarter billion dollars a year, and yeah. uh, you can pay as you go, and there's no debt involved. You use your cash flow. Well, um, I agree with the transfer. It's a bookkeeping thing. It's really more of a political soundbite and a bookkeeping thing, but it's, a, it's the right bookkeeping thing to do. But you cannot pay for all the new roads and construction we need from Highway 74 around Shelby, connecting Ash, Asheville and Wilmington to a much needed connectivity in the Winston-Salem area or Elizabeth City area. Those roads won't be built for 15 years. If we plan to build the ports out in Wilmington and, and Moorhead City, we're not going to find the money by just transferring one bucket to another because even if you do the transfer, I've got to find money to pay for the highway patrol. So you have to, you, just because you transfer one bucket to another, you still have to fill up the other bucket. And that's why I have to look at both ledgers of the sheet, not just a, a political soundbite. Let's well, see if you work this out, November 15 is when we would vote on this. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what we hope for, and there's some hesitation there. And the only reason I want to do it quick is, first of all, there's the immediate need, and the second reason is interest rates will go up. And it's like, do you nail down refinancing your own home right now, or do you risk to wait? If I were wanting to refinance my home right now, I'd do it now because I think interest rates are going to only go up, and that's what the Federal Reserve and, and the major banks are telling us at this point in time. Is, is the repayment of your proposed loan program predicated on economic growth, or could we weather a major market correction, a recession, and still make that payment without pain? That's a great question. We've actually been extremely conservative. We could actually afford to borrow much more but we've put in our calculations in case there is an economic downturn to pay the existing debt with the revenue that we have now. In fact, the revenue will be less in four years than it is today. That's without growth. So uh, we've been very conservative. In fact, there's some division across the street that we ought to borrow more. Um, but we've been very, uh, Lee Roberts, my budget director, goes, this is a good line. And actually, $2.8 billion in a $20 billion budget is not um, a huge percentage of debt. It's uh, considering we did much more than that 15 years ago. I think we're being quite conservative, maybe even too conservative. Before a bond comes, you can expect the legislators to try and either succeed or fail at reforming Medicaid. Should Medicaid be under the Department of Health and Human Services, or should it be under a health benefits authority with, with funding power separate from what Dr. Voss and, and the crew over at DHHS have? It should be under the health and it's in the executive branch under the Health and Human Services uh, Secretary. And uh, if you separate it, you might as well separate everything because you're dealing with the same customer when you're dealing with food stamps, Medicaid, and all the other services that we provide. If we separate them, we just form new bureaucracy. Um, and, and headaches and lack of decision making and an authority, who's accountable for an authority? Who do they report to? I think it's not only bad bureaucracy and accountability, but it's also probably unconstitutional. Um, and that's where we have a court case coming up to rule on such a thing. So I'm joined Governor Hunt and Governor Jim Martin to challenge the constitutionality of forming uh, side groups within the executive branch that have no accountability. Uh, I believe in government with accountability, so if uh, the executive branch does not do a good job, the voters have a chance to deal with it. But if you have a separate authority appointed by politicians, um, you have no control over that authority. And uh, I don't think that's the way our founders uh, meant to uh, um, have government work. Is the, are there attempts to diminish the executive branch power, even if you weren't sitting as governor right I now? think there have been for the last 25 years. I think we've tended to have a legislative branch that uh, has wanted to not only control the um, making laws, which is their responsibility, but also wanted to help execute those laws, which is not the legislative branch's responsibility regarding separation of power. And I feel the same way about the judicial branch. The judicial branch is the interpret law. and. 
I don't want the legislative branch to do their job either, but we'll let the courts decide on that. We've had a three three judge panel already rule in our favor, but uh, I'll respect the rule of law and whatever they decide. But uh, Governor Martin and I actually talked a long time about this on is there a point in time where you challenge that separation of powers? And I'm doing it not only here in Raleigh, but I'm doing it in D.C. I've joined the Texas governor to uh, sue uh, the president on where he, I think he's overstepping his boundaries on the uh, making of laws when his responsibility is to execute the law. So I'm very bipartisan in defending the Constitution and the separation of powers. Is it worth vetoing a good budget to keep policy out of it, like creating a new Medicaid it's, structure? It's, I veto for three reasons. One reason is because I strongly object, and I've done that before. I did that with the uh, Magistrates Bill, where I lost a veto override. It took them a long time to find the votes, and I did not like the process that they took to do that, but I accept that. And um, another reason to veto, as I did with the uh, what was referred to as the Ag-Gag Bill, was to better communicate to the people of North Carolina what was really in that bill. And I believe there were things in that bill that were not conducive to a good public policy and was contradictive toward other po public policy that was previously uh, passed. I knew I would lose that veto, but I thought it was worth uh, vetoing that for education purposes. And also even some legislators during the debate said that bill needed to be changed and will most likely make amendments at a later point in time. So we served our purpose. Back to that magistrate's bill. Um, I know media's pushed you on that before. No and, problem. Uh, but on the magistrate's bill, what is harmed by overriding the veto and letting individual magistrates, maybe it's just a handful, say, I don't want to do gay marriage? When I uh, put my hand on my family Bible, my left hand and raised my right hand, I swore to uphold the Constitution of not only North Carolina but the United States of America. And I have highway troopers doing the same thing. I have other state employees underneath my responsibility who have to do the same thing. I don't believe we should have an asterisk next to that. And um, right now we have an asterisk for one group of people on an issue I happen to agree them with. But if we start only agreeing with parts of the Constitution that we swear to uphold, then um, I think we have a long-term slippery slope. And that's where I disagree with my uh, fellow colleagues in the legislature. What have you made of the balance between social issues as we get towards the end of the 2015 legislative cycle? It makes a lot of headlines and raises a lot of money for both sides. Yeah, I think some of it is for fundraising. On both the left and the right and the media love the social issues, and the media does too because it brings viewers. It's like wa watching a car wreck. And it does raise money for some small interest groups on both the left and the right. And um, people slow down to watch it. And I frankly think we spend too much time on those issues. And now we don't spend as much time as the media says we spend, but I know we, they spent, uh, I think, a day and a half on a gun bill, which um, frankly doesn't do a lot. But boy, people love those types of bills. And uh, they're important, but I think the citizens of North Carolina want us to focus on the economy and education and jobs and, and infrastructure and roads and also uh, making sure we're not taxing our people too much. That's where my 90% of my work is being spent. Yeah, I watched that mattress bill, and every day the bill override, the override vote was calendared, did not take it. Well, that's not because they What's were, the right way to handle your vetoes? If you, if, how would you they feel should have voted on it the next day, but uh, they didn't have the votes the next day or the day after that, and they were debating in a, a private room caucus. And uh, that's the way the Democrats used to do things in the past, and I, I want to change that culture. And, uh, and I'll call out the Republicans if they do the same thing. I'm very bipartisan, and I said I would be when I came. I'm an outsider coming to inside the Beltline here, and I said I'd question uh, cultures and activity that uh, was either coming from the Republican or Democratic Party. I could care less. I'll call them out, and, and as people call me out if they see contradictions. Tim Moore's the new House Speaker. That's of the power three in Raleigh. You and Phil Berger, Dallas Tim. Oh, wait a minute. You're missing a whole branch of government. I think. I'm, a po I'm into <laughs> politics. I think not there, judicial. there's a judicial branch, it. which is very important. We have three branches of government. Two of those leaders are in one branch, and then we have uh, the Supreme Court, and, and we have the governor. I think we've got to educate the public on all three branches. In, in Raleigh here, one of the things I've realized in outsiders is they think everything's happening in the legislative uh, uh, 
portion across the street. That's where the opinions are. No, judges I, don't give you their opinion until it's official. Well, right? judges are, are having a big impact on North Carolina, and so does the executive branch. So. How's House leadership changed in your dealings with them with Tim Moore over Tom Tillis going to well, D.C.? Tom, uh, first of all, was a very good friend. Tim is becoming a good friend. Uh, it took Tom a while to get his feet on the ground as it took me a while to get my feet on the ground. It's a huge job and he's got a huge different coalitions to deal with and he's got a lot more people than Phil has to deal with. The only thing I object to in the legislature, and I said the same thing when Bass Knight and Rand and, and um, uh, some of the former speakers of houses were doing, I think less work ought to be done in the caucuses and more work ought to be done on the floors for the people to hear. And uh, that's my only major disagreement, is that we need, to, we need a form of government where people can break away from the caucus and speak for themselves as opposed to a mass body. And I don't think the founders meant to do that. And that, I see that been happening in D.C. among the Democrats and Republicans, and it's happening here in Raleigh, too. And I think we need to allow our House and Senate members a little more independence. But I understand the dynamics, and there is some... Um, responsibility and benefits of also having some control so you don't deal with every small legislative issue being debated on the floor where we'll, we'll be here forever but there's that fine line that the speaker and the president have and it's a tough job they have a very difficult job as i do as uh, as governor governor's been a pleasure being in your home the people's home to discuss the issues in north carolina thank you so much it's great to be back thank you very much Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.